Okay, hello YouTube. Today we're going to be taking a look at the classical Carol Kahn. Uh, more specifically, we're going to be taking a look at the position after e4, c6, d4, d5, knight c3, d4, knight d4, and we're not going to be taking a look at knight d7 or knight f6 today. We're going to be taking a look at the move bishop to f5. So if you like content like this and you want to see more of it, please go ahead and hit that subscribe button and click on that notification icon. So the move we're going to be taking a look at today is the main line, which is knight g3, and then bishop g6. And I'm going to be introducing you to the idea of making this pawn push, this move pawn to h4. It's a push that I really, really like. One of the main ideas behind it is not only are we threatening, of course, to trap the bishop, which absolutely everybody sees, but we are also threatening to create um, a permanent bind on the king side. And this is actually a very, very important concept. So to understand this concept a little bit more clearly, I want you to understand what the position might look like down the road. So after, say, h6, knight f3 attacking the e5 square, and it is very critical for black to defend that e5 square, and I'm going to be talking about why in a minute, but we're going to have knight d7 defending that e5 square, h5 creating that bind, bishop h7, bishop d3, bishop d3, queen d3. Now, this kingside bind is going to create some very interesting endgame pressure against black. And what I mean by that is if we were to move a knight to the e5 square, black would have two options available to him. He could leave that knight on e5, which would be bad. White would have a huge space advantage with a very dominant piece sitting right in the middle of the board. That's normally a very bad thing for most middle games. And the other option is he could take it. And if he takes it, that d pawn is going to transfer from the d file to the e file. And then white will essentially have what we call a kingside bind, which could be a very serious problem in certain endgames. So kind of to explain that, I want to show you this endgame. Uh, the endgame starts right here, where we have this kingside bind over here. As you can see, this kingside bind is potentially a problem for black. And it doesn't look like it at first. If you're not familiar with this idea, you might not realize how big of a problem this is. But actually, this is the worst case scenario for black. Black is actually left with the worst possible piece for this kingside bind scenario. This knight is helpless against this kingside bind. The whole idea here is eventually this h-pawn is a threat to become passed. And the way that happens is really simple. White's going to play the move pawn to f5. The point is, if an exchange happens, we're taking, like, say, ef5, we're going to play gf5, then we have a traditional passed pawn where we have a pawn majority with, say, e6, e7, e8. And if they come back to try to stop it with their king, we're also threatening to infiltrate with our king, say, king d3, c4, b5, would be a winning idea. We'd have a passed distraction pawn and we'd be able to use that pawn to bring our king to the queen side and essentially win the game. So they're not going to want to exchange, but they're not going to be able to hold everything together either. So like if they play a move like, say, knight e7, we would play f6. And here's the point, is we're always going to be threatening to create a pass to h1. Right now we're threatening the knight, and we're threatening to take on g7, which would win. So they have to kind of take here, and after we recapture, we're always threatening to play g5, h6, h7, h8, which would be completely winning. So let's say they retreat and decide to babysit that pawn. The winning method here would be really easy. We would just play king f4. We would push the pawn. Obviously, if they take, we take back, and we play h6, h7, winning. So there, g6, takes, takes, and that's pretty easy. The other option is they can go active with the knight which isn't much better, but it does require a little bit of finesse from white. We would play king e4. Obviously, they're not going to play, uh, they're not going to exchange the knight at this point because the past h pawn is just too far away from everything. So they would play something like king c6, then we could play g5. They would take, and now there is this threat of the knight coming back to stop the past a pawn, so we're going to have to prevent it, but it's pretty easy to prevent. We would simply play bishop e5, which covers the squares, and then we would simply push this pawn, keeping the bishop in place. And this effectively prevents uh, Black from ever catching this pawn, no matter what he does. And he just simply can't catch it. White would eventually create a queen, and that would be a wrap. So this is endgame pressure. Um, and it exists even in the opening. If we're looking at this opening, we have to be acutely aware of this endgame pressure and the possibilities that are presented by it. 
So black needs to keep a firm grip on the e5 square. If black doesn't keep a firm grip on the e5 square, he's going to end up getting into trouble. And as a matter of fact, in the early opening, uh, when black chooses not to keep a grip on e5, like for example, knight f3, and let's say they play something like knight f6, and we play h4, and they play h6. Now in the past, all kinds of different moves got played here. Uh, Fisher had a pretty famous game that continued bishop d3 here. A lot of people would play knight e5, bishop h7, and then the old move was like bishop c4. But this kind of led to equality. Like after e6, queen e2, uh, black would play knight d5, and this was pretty close to equal. Um, so people weren't liking this. But really the main idea here should just be to play the normal idea. Just play bishop d3, exchange, and then just maintain this knight on the e5 square. This was the idea that was favored by Kasparov uh, when he chose to play this position. So he got the knight on e5, he would just plant it there and just hold it with pawns. He would hold it with his d4 and f4 pawns. And this is just a really difficult position for black to deal with. White is just actually, um, you know, slightly better in these positions. And it's just overall a very difficult position for black to deal with. Um, if you just want to see more of what happened in Kasparov's game, this was actually played in Kasparov versus Bereev in Moscow back in 2004. And Kasparov did go on to win, and actually he won in an endgame. Uh, he managed to eventually get to an endgame, and he won in an endgame. So that just gives you an idea how important controlling that e5 square is. Uh, he had a permanent uh, good position in the middle game because of this really strong outpost. And eventually, Black had to deal with this outpost, and in dealing with it, he ended up with an inferior endgame. So, going back to the main line of everything, we're going to have bishop f5, knight g3, bishop g6, h4, they're going to play h6, we're going to play knight f3, they're going to control that e5 score, which is critical, we're going to play h5, bishop h7, bishop d3, we're going to exchange off those bishops, and we're always threatening to create that bind, so it's really critical that they control the e5 square. The only real alternative that they have here worth trying is maybe something like um, e6. And then after bishop f4, putting more control on that e5 square, they can throw in the move queen a5 check. Now after bishop e2, if they retreat to queen c7, we're going to be right back in the main line. But they have one alternative that they can try, and people do try it, and they will quiz you on it, so you do need to kind of know how to refute this alternative, because it is kind of refutable. And that's the move bishop to b4 pawn to c3, bishop e7, pawn to c4, and then bishop back to b4. Now this is, as far as I can tell, unsound. Like the idea here for white is just to play something like knight e4, threatening to bring this knight into d6, where we can possibly even support it um, with the move pawn to c5. So if, for example, bishop d2, we would simply take back with the knight, we're going to be playing knight d6 on the next move no matter what at that point. So like if queen c7, we would first play c5 and then knight d6. If knight d6, we're going to play knight d6 check, and then we're going to come in and support it with pawn to c5. Now again, one of the main reasons that these ideas all seem to work for white is because we're also threatening to come into e5. Uh, if for example, like the main line is something like knight on g to f6, we're going to play knight d6 check. They can't take the knight with the bishop because it's pinned. So we're going to have king e7, and now we're going to play c5 to support that knight. b6 is the main move to try to break everything apart. We're going to castle to get out of all these pins. Captures, knight e5. If it wasn't for this move, we probably wouldn't be able to save our position with white. But now not only do we save our position, we're actually thriving. The whole point is they can't play king d6 because we have knight c4 check picking up the queen. We're also threatening knight c6 check picking up the queen on the spot. And we're also threatening to fly in to the f7 square with either one of our knights. So as you can imagine, this basically requires black to capture on e5, and then we capture back with the pawn. We have the aforementioned um, bind, um, and uh, the position should be pretty close to completely winning. So this is another um, kind of misconception that I get from a lot of uh, Carol Khan players, is they seem to think that if somehow they manage to pick up this pawn, that this of course would be um, some great and glorious thing and that they would be winning here. Um, of course, in this case, if we pick up this pawn, we just have no activity with black. We're just completely losing um, on every possible front and it would be totally suicide. And in fact, in the game that this was played between Axe and Jimassi in Hungary in 2003, black did try playing uh, the better move. He played knight d5, just trying to block things up. 
but still ended up getting into significant trouble after knight c4, and then a few moves later, Black's position was uh, basically completely lost uh, in the middle of the board. Uh, White's position is just too nice. This move knight e3 was kind of an unfortunate mistake that could have allowed Black to get it back into the game, but White still ended up winning because White still has a very good position here. He could have just continued with the move knight to d6, and this just would have been major advantage White with absolutely no counterplay for Black, and White's just going to be basically completely uh, just practically dead one um, in these positions. So this is kind of the path uh, that we want to go down if they decide to play this independent line uh, with bishop to b4, uh, followed by bishop e7, followed by back to b4. Now if they go back into the main line uh, with queen c7, they can also do this main line with the move order queen c7 first, and then bishop d2, and then e6. And now it's really critical uh, kind of right here that white play his move order here very, very carefully. You can castle here, that's fine. But then after knight on g to f6, it's really important that we play the knight to e4 immediately, and that we try to immediately threaten to play g3 followed by bishop f4. Again, because it is so critical that we control that e5 square, and if we somehow manage to control this diagonal, it would be a very, very good thing for white. So we want to jump on that diagonal as quickly as possible because we want to jump on it before black gets a chance to jump on c5 and do what black really wants to do in this position, which is make a break like c5 or e5 and then exchange off some pieces and then try to equalize the position with his activity. He's not going to have a completely equal position as long as white keeps a grip on all of the advantages that white has, but if white slips up, and plays a bad move order and allows black to free his position, black can very easily equalize. So white has to be very careful about exactly what order he moves his pieces in from this position. So knight e4 is critical, mostly because we need to get it out of the way for g3. So knight takes e4, queen takes e4, we're going to have castles queenside. Now here the move c4, as logical as it looks, would actually be a mistake. It would allow black to free up his game. So to understand what I'm talking about, c5 would be a problem because the normal kind of reply that we would have something to, to something like c5 would be bishop c3 with the express intention of capturing back on the d4 square with the knight. So for example, after knight f6, queen e2, cd4, we would like to play knight takes d4, but here black just has too much activity. Black is able to bring his pieces to life with great effect. So queen f4, king c2, bishop c5, and then let's say we play something like g3 just to kick this queen out of this space advantage situation. After queen e4 check, the only way to keep the position equal now, at this point white is just fighting to keep it equal, would be to play queen c2, and this should be fairly close to equal, but black is super, super active here and has managed to equalize the position without much of a fight. If we were to play queen takes e4, Black is actually better in this position. He's threatening to double our pawns, and we basically have to let him, because if we retreat this bishop, we're losing this knight, and we just don't have another good move. The only other thing we could do is possibly defend that pawn. He is threatening to take it on f2. Once he plays knight c3, bc3, white has the worst pawn structure, and white has the worst game. So we need to be cautious about our move order. We can't play a move like pawn to c4 just willy-nilly, even though if we play accurately after that, we should still be equal if we play very, very carefully. But the move pawn to g3 puts significant pressure on black's position. We are threatening to play bishop f4. We are threatening to take that diagonal. Black has to spend a move to meet that. He needs to play something like bishop d6 to make sure he's got pressure on the e5 square, and more importantly, make sure that we're not planning that bishop on f4 and completely taking over that e5 square. Now we play c4, and now we're going to have, uh, now we're going to play c4, and we're going to have uh, black play something like knight f6, we're going to have queen e2, and then we're going to have c5. So now bishop c3 is a workable idea. There is no queen f4 check. So now after cd4, we're going to play knight b4, we're going to be threatening uh, knight to b5. Now there is actually a slightly different move order that all of this can happen from. Uh, if, for example, if instead of knight f6, they were to play the move pawn to c5 immediately, we would still play bishop c3, and then after c takes d4, we would still play knight takes d4. Now on the surface, it looks like this pawn on c4 is hanging, 
but it's actually not. And this is actually a cute little trap you can catch people in. If they play the move queen c4, pause the video and see if you can find the idea. The winning move here for white is knight to f5, which would be completely winning. We're threatening to play queen takes c4. We're also threatening the bishop on d6 with two different pieces. And if they take our free-looking queen, we have knight takes d6, followed by knight takes e4, simply being up a piece and just having a great position, basically being up the game. So in this position, uh, instead of queen c4, they would have to go back into the main line with something like knight f6, queen, F queen e2, and we would be back in ostensibly uh, what is the main line. So going back to the main line, we're going to have one to c5, bishop c3, d c4, knight d4. We're going to be threatening the knight to b5, so they're going to need to play pawn to a6. Now the main idea here to get an advantage with white, we've got the kingside bind. And in these positions, yeah, since we don't have a pawn on e5, we don't really have much of a kingside bind here. Having the pawn on h5 can sometimes be a liability. Because in a lot of situations, this knight can actually pick off this pawn in the right situation. And black can be up a pawn. But here we have a big middle game advantage in the sense that we have more space. We have more active pieces. Black's king is very loose, very airy over here. He's created a lot of air right where his king exists. And also, we have this potential queen side uh, pawn majority now. We don't have an, a huge advantage on the king side in the end game, but we do have a queen side pawn majority that we might be able to utilize at some point. So still a potential end game advantage on the queen side. The main idea for white here is going to be to play something like king b1, rook c1, and then eventually try to play something like pawn to c5. Not only activating that pawn majority, but cramping black's position so bad that he might not be able to move. And he actually might just start losing material on the queen side because he just won't have any place to put his pieces. So a great example of how that can go very well um, was king b1. We had uh, rook d7. We have rook c1 just lining everything up. The game that we're following here is a Narkiv versus Wang played in China back in 2015. That game continued with king b8 and then simply knight b3, queen c6, and then another advantage of having this pawn on h5 is these potential rook glyphs. We have rook to h4, threatening basically just to play c5, followed by rook c4. And we have everything coming over to black's king side, uh, black's queen side, which is extremely loose and extremely airy because of this a6 and b6 move. Now that game actually continued rook c8, and Anarchiv did go on to win with kind of the very cautious move a3, um, which did eventually win for him. He just activated his queenside pawn majority, and he eventually won, believe it or not, in an endgame, where he had the queenside pawn majority, and it was just very difficult to deal with. Uh, so, again, you know, don't think that just because you're playing the Carol Khan that all the endgames are somehow going to be good for black. This is not the case. A lot of these endgames are good for white. White needs to know how to pressure black's position in such a way that he's constantly threatening to play these advantageous endgames. But a much stronger move for a Narkiv here, which he failed to play, is just the move pawn to c5. There isn't really a great move here for black. Black's best move is to retreat the bishop. If he takes on c5, white can simply take it, and black can't take back. If he plays queen takes c5, bishop e5 simply wins the queen. So he would have to retreat with, say, bishop to c7, and then after rook c4, white would have had a decisive advantage without much of a fight. And honestly, black can barely move his pieces in this position. Black would be significantly, significantly worse here. So that's basically how you should be playing uh, the white side of the classical Carol Khan against bishop f5. These are the best lines. This is how you should be trying to get your advantages. And again, the end game is not something that white should be afraid of. Uh, the, the, the two main conditions that you want to meet when you're trying to get into these end games with white are you want to either have some sort of queenside pawn majority, like in this case, where you have a nice three on two, or you transfer that d pawn and you turn it into an e pawn, and you create that kingside bind, which will give you an advantage in a lot of minor piece end games. Uh, frankly, most of them. So anyways, um, I hope you found this video helpful. I hope you learned something new about chess, and I hope you learned some ideas that you can use in your own games. Thank you very much for watching.